Thank you very much, Pastor Zumpano. Uh, there are some questions that uh, I believe will begin to arise in the hearts of, the, uh, of our viewers and our listeners. Now, you did mention about hell, that hell is actually a place of punishment and not a place of uh, torment that we know about. And uh, in the book of Revelation, we are told that hell, uh, hell and death will be put in fire or something like that. Can you throw more light on this? It says in Revelation 20, verse 10, that death and hell will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is the word theon, God's spirit. It will be consumed by God's spirit. God's spirit is the spirit of life, not death. Therefore, hell cannot continue to exist. However, the concept of hell is a theological concept of men. Scripture refers to that as doctrines of men. Now, there is something that is thrown into the lake of fire, and it has something to do with some sort of a state of the soul life that is caught after death between uh, the present and the time of the restoration of all. And whatever that state is, we refer to as a hell state. But let me qualify that by telling you that uh, my own personal impression is that uh, it's referring to what Jesus referred to as the outer darkness. Oh. The outer darkness. And by the way, that Greek word skotia in the Greek means physical darkness. Okay? There is also another word for darkness in the New Testament scripture where it refers to the angels chained in darkness. Mm. And that word in the Greek means spiritual darkness. Okay? So we're talking here about a physical place where uh, people are uh, in a holding state of some sort, awaiting the completion of uh, uh, the work that God has to do in them and through them, huh? Okay, now let me recapitulate by telling you that the concept of hell is foreign to the Old Testament and the Jewish mind, okay? Something very important to understand because we say that, uh, and we teach, that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Huh? And I would qualify this by uh, uh, presenting to you for your consideration several observations about the Old Testament. One, that there is no such word in the Old Testament such as eternal judgment. Doesn't exist in the Hebrew. Secondly, there is no such word in the Old Testament as hell in the Hebrew. Now, some of you are going, to, especially you theological types, are going to come to me and you're going to say, now wait a minute, Burn, there's the word Sheol in the Hebrew, okay. which has been translated as hell, and that's been used that way for centuries and centuries, and that's what it means. And my answer to you is no, it does not. If you look at the King James Version of the Bible, the word Sheol occurs 32 times in the Old Testament. It is translated as hell 16 times, and it is translated as the grave 16 times. Well, hold on. Which is it? Say, is it hell or is it the grave? But it can be both. Okay, and what you'll find is the King James translators really didn't know. So what they did was they used one definition or the other to fit the verse that they were trying to translate at that time. The reality of it is that the word Sheol in the Hebrew of the Old Testament means neither. It doesn't mean hell and it doesn't mean the grave. It means the unseen or the unperceived. That's the literal translation of the word Sheol, the unseen and the unperceived. What Jesus would refer to in the New Testament as the outer darkness, something we don't see or perceive, a state of being, okay? 
Now, also understand that in the Old Testament, they had no concept of eternal damnation for sin after death. That is, eternal damnation after death for sin committed during this life. Now, why is that? Because the Hebrew mind, see, you must understand the Jewish mind. The Hebrew mind was uh, very accurate in its uh, understanding that God dealt with man's sin in the here and now. And in throughout the Old Testament, there is no mention of God dealing with man's sin in eternal torment forever and ever. It doesn't exist. So there is no Old Testament type or typology for eternal damnation or eternal torment. It's always been understood that God dealt with them, the Hebrews, uh, or the Jews, he always dealt with them and their sin in the here and now. If it was committed in this existence, God dealt with them in this existence. Now, is it the same thing as Hades? The word Hades has been translated as hell. But the word Hades is from Greek mythology. Okay? It's from Greek mythology. And when it is used in the New Testament, it is synonymous with the grave. Okay. The grave. The grave. Yes. Now, uh, let me ask you another question. Now, this revelation that is coming out, uh, this revelation, is it that people do not know it? Is it that preachers, uh, pastors, and teachers, is it that they do not know this? Is it part of the apostasy? Or is there a reluctance on their own part to uh, let the, the church know this or what? What do you think is responsible that for a, a long period of years this uh, idea of hell and the restoration of all has, has been sustained up to now? Well, the answer to that is that uh, part of it is the apostasy, which has so taken over Christendom that uh, if the apostles were here today and they saw how we practice the Christian faith, they would recognize that this is the farthest thing from what they taught and preached. That's the first point. Mm -hmm. The second point is that the restoration of all has been taught throughout history by small groups of spirit-filled remnant Christians who have existed in every generation from the time of Enoch unto the present. All the prophets of old preached the restoration of all, Acts 3.21 says. It says, until the time of the restoration of all spoken by all the prophets of old. All the prophets of old. See, this is not a 20th century doctrine. This was the doctrine of salvation in the first 400 years or 500 years of the church before Augustine. As a matter of fact, in 1871, Hansen published uh, a book called The Restitution of All Things, the Prevailing Doctrine of the Early Church, in its first 500 years. That book can be freely downloaded for free to your computer and you can still read that 18, uh, I think it's 1891 publication uh, in which uh, uh, he reviews the whole history and all of the scripture that uh, originally existed on this and how it was distorted through history because of the apostasy. Mm -hmm. And you can get a free copy of that, by the way, by going to tentmakers.org, okay, uh, Gary Amaralt's site, and in the section of that website called Scholar's Corner, you can download a copy of Hansen's book. Uh, and there's also another book by Andrew Jukes in which he talks about the doctrine of eternal 
damnation and eternal punishment and how that developed and came about. He wrote that publication in 1871, and that's also freely downloadable at tentmakers.org. See? Uh, so the point I'm trying to make to you is throughout history, people have been teaching this, but the religious spirits and the religious organizers who want to maintain control over the people through fear, which is why Augustine taught it, because they taught outside of the Catholic Church there is no salvation, therefore salvation is dependent on us. You better believe in eternal damnation and eternal torment or you're going to lose your salvation. That's what they taught the people in the 400s. That's what they're teaching the people today. I have news for you. Salvation is not dependent on a church. Salvation is dependent on a person, a savior, and his name is Jesus. Amen. So you are saying in essence that uh, the doctrine of hell as we know today in the church is actually man's doctrine. It's a doctrine of men. It's a doctrine of men. There is an interim state of the unbeliever called the outer darkness. Okay? Uh, and that's what Jesus referred to. Okay? As a matter of fact, there's even a, a scripture in Matthew in, in where Jesus kids. says the children of the kingdom will be cast into the outer, outer darkness. darkness. Okay. Of teeth. The, where there will be weeping of gnashing of teeth. There will be weeping of gnashing of teeth in the lake of fire. Revelation 20 says, why? Because in the presence of the spirit of truth, which is like a mirror, those in the lake of fire see themselves uh, for what they are for the first time. The truth of what they are, you see? And that causes weeping and gnashing of teeth, see? The Holy Spirit is like a mirror, and he shows you yourself. Amen. See? Now, one more question before okay. we... Go. Now, does it mean that uh, an, a, a born-again believer who does not know, or let me say who does not believe, or maybe who does not know is more appropriate, this uh, uh, doctrine of hell, does it, does it have anything to do with his being raptured, or does it, have, does it affect his uh, eternity eventually? No, because God is sovereign. Right? God has a plan and a purpose for every man's life, and he is carrying it out, and he is faithful, and he will not fail. He is not the God who failed. He is Savior of the world, the Scripture says. He is not a Savior who failed the world. Okay? He is not the Savior of some. The Scripture says he is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. 1 Timothy 4.10. Deal with that. Deal with that scripture. He is the savior of all men, especially those who believe. But the implication of that verse is he's also the savior of unbelievers. See, now some are saved uh, now in the here and now. The Old Testament saints were saved after death. It says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in 1 Corinthians 15, it shows us that there is a time schedule for people being saved, but it's his time schedule. And so he, it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the, those who are saved first are those who are Christ, then those who are Christ at his coming, and then the rest, the scripture says. So there is an order in which Jesus saves people. So some are going to get saved in the lake of fire after death. Some are going to get saved in the afterlife, see? But not all are going to get saved in the here and now, but because you don't see your people saved and they die without having confessed Christ, I have news for you. That's religious. That's religious, you know? It isn't, say, salvation is not dependent on what they do. Jesus said no man can come to the Father unless the Father call them. The Father calls people at different times. Say, and that's why the blood of Christ goes backward in time and forward in time. And by the way, that's what the book of Hebrews says. Mm. Okay, it's somewhere between chapter 7 and chapter 9 of Hebrews. It says that the blood of redemption is eternal. It goes back in time and forward in time. 
So we have to get back to the early doctrine of the church and walk in the power of the early church, see? And so my answer to you is that uh, the implication of Scripture is that all are saved and all are saved in his timing, but they are all saved. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about your loved ones. All you have to do is pray for the Father to call them. Say. Well, now if I want to summarize what you have been saying, it's like the ultimate plan of God is to save his creation. But there is a time allotted for uh, each maybe faces. Now it's like a man who has uh, a child that uh, no matter what happens to that child, it's, it still belongs to him. He cannot because the child does one, one evil or the other, now abandon the child. The world is still God's creation and he will still save the creation. Is that, is that the, the, the picture? Is that what you Well, that's, that's part of it. The other part of it is this, that when any fallen being is presented to Christ in his presence, they will discover something that the Bible doesn't uh, uh, talk about except in one verse. It refers to the God of all grace. All grace. And he says, my grace is sufficient. Huh? And what that simply means is that when they come to his presence in the lake of fire, they're going to discover something. Two things about his grace. One, his grace is infinite. Two, because of who he is. Two, his grace is irresistible. It cannot be resisted. Mm. See, mm. that's why the scripture says in the Old Testament that God is able to change the heart of the king. Why is he able to change the heart of the king? Because of his grace and being irresistible and because of his will being indomitable. See, there is no such thing as someone going to hell out of their own free will. It doesn't exist because there is no such thing as free will. The Bible doesn't talk about free will. The Bible uh, implies limited will. Why? Because the word free means to be totally and completely unobstructed. By definition, that's the dictionary definition of the word free totally and completely unobstructed, and in this existence, only God's will is totally and completely unobstructed. So free will is sovereign will, and that belongs to God alone. If you had a free will, okay, then God would not be God because your will would be as free as his will because free can't be any more free than free. Mm. See? So what ends up happening then is that if your will were as free as God's will, then he would not be God. Mm. Huh? Because you would be co-equal with him. Mm. Huh? And so what we see is the scripture does not talk about free will. That's, the, that's humanist doctrine of the humanist philosopher Erasmus, uh, who published that kind of stuff in the 1400s. Okay? Listen. God does not call you to be a saved humanist. God calls you to be a biblical thinker. Say, God calls you to think about the scripture. Okay? How could you love God, okay, if he was going to uh, burn people in an eternal fire forever and ever for the limited number of sins they did in space and time? during their uh, earthly lifetime here. The motive to love him becomes fear because you're afraid of what he's going to do to you. Listen, the scripture says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you think God wants them to be doing that out of force? God doesn't want them doing that out of force. God doesn't want them doing that out of fear. The motive for God wanting every knee to bow and every tongue confess is love. And he is eternal love. Amen. And he will work a work on every being in the lake of fire, okay, to turn them from destruction to life 
and to restore the once sinless universe that he had. And let me tell you something, that will be his greatest miracle. That will be the demonstration of his greatest power. And that will be for his greatest glory. Amen. Well, one more last question. One moment, please. Uh, Jesus said, no man can come to me except my father draws him. Yes. And uh, he also said, there are some vessels he has made unto honor and some unto dishonor. Yes. Can you reconcile this in the ultimate scheme of things that uh, he, he has made some people to actually uh, give their life to Christ at a particular lifetime and as he made some people to give their life to Christ, uh, is it after the death or what? Can you reconcile this as the ultimate scheme well, of things? Well, God has purposely permitted by his sovereign will people to live holy lives, vessels of honor, or people to live unholy lives, vessels of dishonor. That's what the Bible says. Is that say permission, permissive will? That's his permissive will. Okay. Well, you talked about now, choice of, uh, sorry, you talked about free will, that man does not have a free will. Man does not have so a how free does will. So how does it respond to, to the permissive will of God making someone a vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Well, it's very simple. The answer to that is in the scripture itself, that God is the author and finisher of our faith. And because someone, he has authored someone's life to walk in dishonor, okay? does not mean that they will end up that way. Okay? Why? You remember at the beginning of this uh, series, I said to you that what God is doing, he, he, whether it's honor or dishonor, he settled everyone's salvation before the creation, didn't he? Okay? So what he's obviously doing is he's causing us to walk out this salvation through experience by which he teaches through contrast good and evil. Well, if he's author and finisher, an author is someone who writes a book or a play or a newspaper article or a, 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 a magazine article, but he authors it and he authors what the characters are to do when he's telling that story. Mm -hmm. God is telling a story, is what he's simply doing. He doesn't have an ounce of harm in him. He said in Luke 10, 19, nothing, 10, 19, nothing by any means will harm you. Well, you either have to believe that or not believe it, see? So what we are actually doing is we are following the script of our lives that Jesus has authored, okay? If he teaches by contrast, by good and evil, contrasting good and evil, you'll never know what evil is unless there are people there to carry it out. How else? So there are going to be people assigned in their, in their life to walk that way because it serves his purpose, which shows that his will is sovereign over all men. See? So the sovereign will of God controls all events, and it's for his purpose. He hasn't fallen off of his throne, folks. Amen. Okay? I promise you. Okay, and so what we're seeing through all of this is that in that scripture, if God is sovereign, okay, then we have limited will, or if some people call it choice. But guess what? The choices that he makes for a person who, or the choices that he gives to a person who is a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor, those choices are framed by the circumstances that he creates around them. So he imposes his sovereign will over all circumstances, including their circumstances, thus limiting their choices. And based on that, they will either walk in dishonor or they will walk in honor until he is done telling his story. Wow. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. So it means everything, whether unto honor or unto dishonor, is for his ultimate glory. Everything is about his ultimate glory. I have people say, you mean he's going to save Satan after all Satan did uh, uh, to me? And this and that, I want to see him burn in hell. I want to see him continue to burn forever. I want to see this and that. And they go ranting and raving in front of me about why is God going to do this? And I have to say to them, well, because he loves all in his creation. 
And Satan never had a choice in what he was supposed to do when he was created. He was created evil to carry out evil. See, the devils and the demons, the same. They, they were made that way to carry out God's purpose because God teaches by contrast. But there will be a day when all of that will be over. How do you know that? Because Ecclesiastes says, all things have their season and a time for every purpose under heaven. So there will be a day when evil will end. There will be a day when there will be no more devil or demons. There will be a day when there will be no more aliens. There will be a day when all will confess and bow and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, this is deep. It appears as if we should not stop, but we have to momentarily uh, stop, but we're going to uh, pick up some other time. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Zampano, for this time. And uh, viewers, we appreciate your staying there and uh, watching this. I know there are so many questions you may have. You can get across to us through email or through post. Our email address is questions at walkinginpower.org questions at walkinginpower.org or you may also send, uh, you may also call a uh, number in the USA or in, in Nigeria, Africa. We will be back some other time. Till then, may the Lord bless you as you live a witness for Christ. God bless you.